Trevor Meredith from the National Optical
may remember that time. Phew. I managed to make my first uh, high school reunion last year at 55. It was amazing how number of people were still there. And I, since we moved so much, even when I was there, I didn't know them very many. But there were two or three there that uh, I remembered and they remembered me. Then I went down the street closer to the high school to junior college, an old elementary school building for two years started by the University of Pittsburgh. I had physics with no calculus. I had some other courses which were just wonderful because the first targets were either old timers in the late or uh, sort of postdocs who came out and used this program to teach. And most of them were dynamite. I never learned anything in high school hardly except what I read. And I learned by reading that I knew more than I was there to instruct. That wasn't true at college. It opened my eyes to a lot of things. So I applied to a number of, well, I had looked at where I should apply to college. I was uh, sort of in 10th grade, I was studying archaeology, and all my reading showed me that astronomy was where it's at, it still is. Uh, so I went through all the catalogs that were in the uh, library, and the one that had the most courses and the largest faculty was the University of Chicago. So I applied there to see how lucky I've been in my career. And why was I accepted? That's the next big question. Because part of the entrance exams, I went A, B, C, D. I must have hit the right code because I passed them all. And I got there. I was then on the campus at the University of Chicago on the south side of Chicago, the area where the wind blows in your face no matter which way you're walking. It's very cold. And I had physics courses there and a few other things for two years. And I can tell you it was one of the most remarkable times in anybody's life because about half the faculty had no real prizes. And one or two that did were we'll getting them soon. Uh, I learned also uh, in real life and that one or two of those were really good instructors, really nice people, and one or two of them couldn't teach them or any other reason. There was one instructor, I won't tell you who she was, but she had a Nobel Prize. You can figure it out, maybe. If you go back and forth like this around the classroom, smoking nonstop, talking something or other, and every now and then filling the board with something or other, and nobody in the class had the faintest idea what it was, so except for the textbook, it was totally useless. Uh, however, most of the courses were fast and fail, she passed her job. And you get to know her because you lit her cigarette when she came by. Too. <laughs> and you never read that in a textbook studio or today, but it's interesting. Murray Gelman was the uh, instructor there the first time, first year he ever taught. He just had a, a first PhD. He was younger than most of the faculty. I think he was my 19th. Because he was a genius. He still got a Nobel Prize later. He had a job there for a long time. It was an interesting time. There. Well, after the two years, then I went up to your observatory, which is where all the astronomy department was then. Much later, I think it was a good part of it, now all of it in Chicago. But it was up there then. I hadn't met some of them before because uh, one course every semester, every quarter, was taught by somebody from Chicago, usually one of the top people uh, from the astronomy. So Chandrasekhar and Stromgren and then Kiger would come down once a week. There were about three of us students in the physics department, me and another one. And then four or five of the physics faculty, including people like Elman, sitting in our course. Every stop. Good. At Yerkes, it was the golden years still at Yerkes. Perhaps the wave just before me was the peak of the golden years there, but it was probably a peak, the highest peak of any university astronomy at any time. Uh, but it was still a really good when I was there. There were three times as many faculty as there were students. Uh, many of the students, if they survived, uh, went on to do very well. It was quick. I was a research assistant the first year. Uh, besides being accepted, I got a full-time scholarship and full-time room for it, too. They couldn't believe either. When I went to the University of Chicago when I arrived in place. Uh, not quite with a free ride, but pretty much. Most of the time I was there. Couldn't afford it otherwise because, remember, my dad was in the minister. My uh, first job was a research assistant with the 40 inch refractor. So, the first telescope I ever used, almost the first one I ever saw, was the largest refractor in the world. The guy said, Here. Well, you learn fast. Uh, later on, I spent a lot of time observing the Galactic Observatory in Texas. Because at that time, Texas owned it, but they didn't have any astronomers. So, Chicago ran the whole thing. Because Truby got it going and it served a lot during the war. Uh, and uh, there was plenty of time. 
else to give a seminar. Uh, it was the period after me when he gave up the one that he was to but at least to his gear and time was there. Uh, I also would talk with him out on the golf course in the afternoon. And I went over to get coffee and come up and walk around. Uh, really delightful fellow. So I did not switch from theory as a general, but because of my bent in life, it was much, much more empirical. To me, theory was wonderful and very interesting. And as Sandra himself said many times, it's very interesting, even true. <laughs> <laughs> but I was much more of an empiricist, so I did it. I wanted it to be correct, true, and right. Strongman was there, Kuiper was there, Morgan was there. Almost anybody, an international, not just national astronomer, passed through the four years out there. So you got to know everybody. Since it was a small community, you got to know personally, too. A lot of stories. I don't know what you're going to tell you. Right now. But it was a very good exposure to the best. To their research, how they looked about research, their philosophy of research, and many other things that they don't teach you. Right? And that firsthand. Good stuff. Many good students, too. I mentioned sort of the humor that the chiefs have occupied. I mean, you didn't fuck out uh, and one or two days actually didn't make it. They basically died. But if you came out of there, nobody ever intimidated you again. You were really conditioned for life and strong research and other things. At McDonald's, I used to force the 36 inch and 82 inch that I mentioned. I did my thesis work there, empirical thesis. Uh, I developed a system of H beta photometry, which I could use to get absolute magnitudes of these stars. Stronger. He had developed, and I helped a lot with the four color stronger. Much more information resolution than the UVB. But for example, Johnson was a year before six months when I was there. I talk about every day about the time. So were other people. So were some unsung people like Dan Harris, who knew more about photometry than probably all of them. Very good stuff. So through that, I developed a standard star system for those things. I developed techniques to get absolute magnitudes and hence be able to do, if you like, geography and sociology and solar neighborhood things. All the fundamental basis of what's going on. Find it to go back to structure. So I did a lot of the scaffolding type stuff, stuff you don't see in the newspaper, but the stuff that was really important for a lot. So my papers have always got a lot of citations. I may come back and mention that a bit later. But I did get a PhD, and that's the only degree I have. I like to say I was too dumb to get a bachelor's.
just said I kept research alive through much of that period, and certainly before and some after. And it certainly uh, ticked off some of the people on the staff that I was always getting more citations in my papers than they were ever working on dynamite things. They thought, because I was doing this fundamental kind of stuff, kind of stuff which gets referenced. I go back to that maybe. At the end of the telescope period, I was in charge of all the technical stuff I did. Anything except administration and science. And, uh, I can't go that out for two years, but then I say, this is not And I'm back to research. <coughs> Clearly, because of the telescopes, because astronomy is a very international field, I traveled an awful lot. I was a member of the American Astronomical Society, the International Astronomical Union, in the beginning, Astronomical Society, the many amateur groups, including the League.
statement is pretty simple. It's on the top of our membership form that I'm going to wave around later. And everywhere else. To preserve and protect the nighttime environment and our heritage of dark skies through quality outdoor lighting. And we are making a great deal of success. We are certainly manpower and financing tons of stuff we can do. We know what to do and we know how to do it, but we need a lot to be an army to do all these things. However, our community has grown and was incorporated in 1988. We're very close to 11,000 official members. That's bigger than the national lighting organization. It's bigger than the international lighting organization. That gets people's attention in politics and in the public and in those organizations. It does help. There have been many successes, I could go on forever, but look at the website and see many others. And ordinances, we have changed the lighting industry 180 degrees from the quantity of light to the quality of light. Guarantee you that that has happened. It's slowly washing out into the field. We would love it to go faster. There's also many more things that have occurred to home and many other things. There's so much to do. We run under gross overload. It's not just sitting in airplane seats. It's a gross overload for everybody. So I like to say that through this history, you can see, well, I'll tell you the story about it. One of the years, also in construction, I was all day with one of the contractor and engineers for the building. It's also and somewhere in the middle of the afternoon, and he says, hey, you know, it's really strange. I was educated in civil engineering, and you were educated in astronomy. But if you're any good at what you're doing, you become an accountant. It's true. Isn't it? So I tell that, that I have faith scientist into a project manager, but not leaving this run. We have our research behind uh, into being an accountant and not leaving that behind. But now it becomes an evangelist. And so I talk a lot to a lot of groups about astronomy, about good light, about light pollution, all that stuff. It's good. It's all common sense. It's in the sense of persistence. It's in the sense of showing up. IDA has a lot of resources. The website is just continually upgraded for many more things. We can do a lot more, but we do what we can with nobody. We have a newsletter. This is the one they issued before, which Bob had some copies here. The most recent one, dated June, is on the website now and in mail. Lots of good stuff. We have a lot of information sheets. We we'll try to have many more. We have PowerPoints, not this one, but many, many others. We have all uh, the talks at all of our past meetings on CD. Uh, their PowerPoints. These are from really excellent people. This last March we had from all things an artist talking about how artists see the night and how they see color and light. I'll show you a picture of one. Not that artist. We have urologists speak to us about the fundamental basics of visibility, which in fact most people in lighting have always. I'll bet almost none of you either. And I didn't harm the hardly anybody to what a year. We have meetings, an annual meeting every year in March in Tucson, which is also our business meeting, a small meeting, some place or other. Uh, this year it's going to be in Yellowstone Park in September. It's on the website. Next year our annual meeting again is in Tucson, and we also have an annual European meeting that Bob was involved with for a long time. Uh, this last year it was in Paris. Again, we keep track of it. No. And the year before in Paris, the year before in Chicago, they'll continue every year. Next year, we're starting with one in Asia Pacific region, probably in Sydney, where we have a very strong activist. So it's all growing, and uh, I'm very interested. Well, of course, being an evangelist, I can't help even a few tips on life.
don't get discouraged when you run into a city council that won't pass the ordinance you want tomorrow. You'll get out. Maybe it'll take six years, but eventually, if you're persistent, always pushing, never so hard to make an enemy. And you know more than they do. Be sure that you do it. It works. We hear that all the time. I know it works because there's thousands of ordinances out there now and lots of other things. And remember, we turn the National Lighting Organization and their standards Lots of other things. I'll just show you one or 
two of these in slightly more detail. The so-called star. The continuum, the lines, the bands, and the breaks. As I said, remember, I got to do my thesis on the precise measurement of the each beta line from the prime. A line in the spectrum of stars. The rotation of the star affects that, so it's the magnetic field. There's certain stellar materials right close to the star, but there's a lot of flares and other stuff. Duplicity, which sometimes you know or don't, or even more than duplicity, polarization of the light, and on and on. To do photometry well, you have to take all that into account. Because in some cases, that's what you want to find out about. In other cases, you want to make sure they're not mucking up your work. Background, the general sky background, the sky globe, both natural and artificial, the nebula that it may be in. I'll give you a couple of examples later. Crowded field effects, like the globular cluster, photon statistics of the background, and on and on. I think I have one more. The atmosphere. The difference in air mass of where you're observing it, whether you're doing all sky photometry or differential photometry. All extinction, you need mean values, and if so, what? How do you get All the effects of the site, both east, west, north, south effects, altitude, conversion layers, time effects, the clouds, and neutral. Can you work through clouds to do some of them? Pretty sure it's easy, but you don't know what you're doing. Temperature, humidity effects on that, and on everything else up there. <coughs> the time scales is something very short, long term, is the extinction in the atmosphere area of these time scales, and much else. I don't have one of these here, but I have a printed material for all of them. How can you actually do any photography? You know, if I give this talk to a bunch of photographers, they still have it. You can't do any photography. Seven's one of the first people to do photographic photography. He said, if you're really going to determine extinction, you can't do anything else. And of course, if you want to observe stuff, you know, how are you going to get extinction? Plus all the other stuff. Plus, nowadays, you don't get anywhere near enough telescope time. Plus, you've been growing boys and somebody else did the standards well and you trust them. There's a million pitfalls that you can get into. And I guarantee you there's a lot of people that get into it. I'll show you a couple of them. So what I learned was be careful. Do it right. Have a lot of controls. Do you all know the difference between precision and accuracy? Precision is the internal stuff. Accuracy is how it relates to the world. I can go on on that one forever. But, you know, you still can do the Look at this. This is a published paper for two different stars, or two published papers for two different stars. It's a visual blue minus visual and up about minus blue, the color indices. These are what the two papers got for the same star. Each of those papers claimed that their accuracy was about 0.01, not more than 0.01. Good stuff. 
papers that's producing scale. How does the number of students using that telescope scale that? How does the citations to those papers scale? And how does the cost scale? So you don't have to start from scratch and do the math in your head. Oops, I give you a table. So there's the aperture from a half meter to one meter, from 40 inch down to 15 meter. And there's the square. So the 15 meter is collecting 225 times the number of photons per unit time, we hope, as the one meter, provided everything is equal in its own. That's easy. Now, how do you suppose that the number of users scale the telescope aperture? How many more people? use a 15 meter than use a one meter. Same amount? Double that. What well, a huge number. Interesting question. Did you ever hear that asked before? Well, it's just that on big telescopes, they're being constantly sought after hundreds of people. Right? Uh, no, I'm trying to use it. How many yeah. use them? Yeah. Now, this is, of course, a number you can get, because you can go to the observing levels of various telescopes and get these numbers. Some people have told me in professional audiences it scales with a negative power. Because here again, let me ask you a couple of things, you know, to make it more complicated. Suppose it scaled with a half the square root. That would say four times as many users as with half. Ah, some people could believe that. But isn't it the same old card rate for the same people using that telescope? Whereas the only place most people can get the telescope time is on one view. So maybe it is in person. Then also think of teams. Do you count it as a team getting the time, or do you count that night for every individual on the team? And what is the net result? And you get complicated pretty fast. I am, of course, a cynic about many things. And so I delight in rambling things like this around. So that I probably should pay for it. But how about the number of papers? Well, everybody knows a 15 meter that's more important to astronomy than a one meter. But if you think I got more citations that's not universally true, but it can be. Now, of course, how many students are using the 15 meter? Where do they get their time? How many people in a third world country who have very bright ideas sometimes are getting time on a 15 meter compared to one meter? Very interesting subject, isn't it? It borders right off astrosociology and astropsychology, doesn't it? So I put it in a half power one again, then a 1.5 power. Because in principle, you can make some arguments. And maybe in the extreme, you would get 60 times the number of citations for a paper on a 15 meter than on a 1 meter. I don't personally believe that. But you would think we're going to get more than that. So my point here, and my, you know, my nature of whatever throwing is, you're not ever going to get that above one and a half, and it's likely to be more down here. Now, remember my last one? How does the cost of the telescope scale with that? There is no way on earth you'll get it under 2.5. History shows that a number of people, including me, has shown that it's about 2.8. It's not as large as 3, which some people might argue. Now look at the figure there down on the bottom for 2.8 power. Then compare that with the number of users and the number of citations. And so a real city would say, we should never build a 15 meter. But they're wrong, because there's some things where this is what counts. And you have to pay that premium. Now I could extend this to another line over here by putting in state dollar figures and saying, what did the public space telescope cost on a scale like this? But it's almost immaterial if you can get it, because it does things the other stuff. So the real conclusion to draw is balance is what counts. You need telescopes of all sizes. You also need to observe at all different wavelengths, many different kinds of detectors, many different kinds of people with bright ideas. Balance is what counts. That's the important thing. Anyway, kind of fun, huh? Have you ever heard any of that before? Not there very well. Let me give you an example of some small telescopes, what I call NAT. You know what a NAT is? It's a little thing that bites the big guys. So it's kind of cute. 
Monday when it is first. Who did that? Let's see what I've missed there. Oh, a couple other things I will mention, of course, when we talk about telescope costs, that's capital cost, isn't it? You need that money up front. It's like a university like this. You get capital cost to build the building, you can't stack it. You get capital cost to build a telescope, you can't get money to run it. Make you lots of that. So you have to do, you have to include that kind of stuff too. You also have to consider in the astro politics and astro psychology about sharing costs with others. Building out many of the big telescopes now could not ever have been done without multiple groups splitting the costs and splitting the operation, and frankly, splitting the good ideas. A couple other things I want to mention is what about the site? You know, to put a four meter telescope on one site, Another site can make a big difference in cost and in operation. Not even running into where it creates squirrel problems, which I tell you can cost <coughs> millions of dollars. How about a site that has twice the number of good nights as another third house? How about a site that has <coughs> twice the scene quality as another site? These all have to be counted, don't they? You know how many people count that stuff? The other thing which, of course, is needed in balance is the kind of work that I did in scaffolding. Fundamental basic stuff. And the bad stuff. I mean, it's not just bad. I'm not using that as a bad word. But the stuff that's hot right now, uh, they got to work on too. They got to work on everything. You got to work on multi wavelengths. It's very important for that. Well, I'm going to use NAD as a quick example. What NAD is, well, it's not what it started out as, but what it is now is a series of 14 inch telescopes. Perfectly stationary. They sit there. They look at flat regions of the sky. That's it. They have a 40 or 50 minute field of view. On the telescope at the Newtonian, there is a CCD, which operates in a scan. What happens is the sky veers across, the CCD is going the other direction, so you get a three minute exposure on that field. Without a filter, that takes you to 21st magnitude. So for some problems, you don't need a filter. For others, you do it. You can easily calculate you know, the effects of the filter on the magnets and on and on. But it's nifty. Can you imagine how low cost that is? Can you imagine how many people can use it? Let me go back to my thing. Can you imagine the amount of data it gets? I'll come back to some of those. But what can it do? Uh, I'll show you more details. But it's a great way to find extra solar planet transits. We gave, uh, we tried to get some funding about 10 years ago for that. Everybody here is doing proposals that can be done. You know, everybody's doing it now. Yeah, not us. Near Earth Protractions. Roy Tucker, who's involved in this, finds about one third of such things. Everybody. Asteroids, variable star monitoring, supernova detection. If there's something going off in that band, we get it. I'll give you a couple examples later. Artificial satellites. One sneaky way to try to get it funded that may still work. Find all the artificial satellites put up by the military and take them out of the field before you publish. Thermometric standards. You get a lot of data in a fixed load. Good stuff. Anything that's long term, it's not. You keep that thing going and you can because there's no astronomer to muck it up. They just stay there and it works. All the time. A couple more. It's a fixed position, scan mode. You could eat, there would be sort of basically three or four at every site. Now you can put two such systems at a site, or more. But the real key, the real key then is to go to multiple sites. All of them good, but none of them so exquisite you have to pay a premium. So Southwest Arizona, there's lots of places like this. So you get longitude coverage, you get latitude coverage. The thing doesn't work very well in more than 50 degrees, but there's not all that much sky. Cool. They have the same focal length, so you processing is something easier. A little bit more data for those than that. That's what one of them looks like. Ordinary welder. Including the CCD photometer detector, 
demand mode works. Don't waste any photons. High productivity. Eat it all out, you're not wasting time. That's so calibrations are easy. Two years produced eleven thousand C C D ROMs from three thousand. How much that is on those? It's a small C C D to you know what an instrument costs on a ten meter? Here's a picture of one of the images. Three minutes. How does that fit some more We had uh, a student, really good one, for two years who came in and developed a pipeline so that it comes from the CD into the computer. He's organized all that and just kind of all of that. But you need that. Otherwise, you can't go into the world. Asteroids. Two years ago, this was the ninth most productive asteroid in the world. There's one on. I think we already have this on a 10 second thing. The doctor, you're getting it all at the same zenith distance. That cuts things down. You can get extinction really easy. It's very stable, nothing changes. Go add images, blink images, all kinds of things. This is an example of one. A lot of stuff that it looks at, of course, you find to be harder. In this band, First band they were in the variable star catalog. There were 282 known variables. They picked up 35,000 more. Gets galaxies. We would estimate. I don't know what the current thing is, what they found, but based on that many galaxies, it's under the thing when you get them. Furthermore, you got it before they went out. I 
lot of slides on this. I only pulled out one or two. What about that? On the left, there's a schoolhouse, an elementary schoolhouse with floodlights on the side. This is three o'clock in the morning. Where have you lived over there? My joke is two things. Street lights off, isn't it? I guarantee you, it's working. Photo cell turns it off. Things just stay on. Put all the light on the street. It's all those no floodlights. High expense. Look down the street at the next light. About a 30-year-old mercury light. Glare it. Look at all the light on the street down there. Because it's declined down to about 10% of its initial output, but it's still very glary because it's against the somewhat dark background. Does any of this make any sense? This was in Arizona, actually. Somebody I want to stir around the dust so you can succeed it. All these slides are available from my age. How many of those are around here? Or in other places? Glary, overlit. Yes, Why do they do that? Safety. <laughs> That's about as unsafe as you can get. Many motorists leave these things with their lights off. Many come in, can't see very well. Neighbors have. We have ones which also show good examples of all of this stuff. Now, what was the task there? Like the parking lot? Like the entrance? Like the tree? Clearly, it's doing a terrible job. Also, look at the sign. You can all read what it says on the sign, can't you? That's called luminance overload. There's far too much white light coming from the background. She can't read a damn thing. Why does anybody do this kind of stuff? And yet, there's more of this stuff around than the good stuff. This is a pair of slides. On the left, you see a student on a campus major university campus in the West, not in Arizona. And she's standing there in the middle of the hallway. They got a lot of complaints from faculty and students that this was unsafe for their life uh, beforehand. And so they changed it to this. Stop. Globes. Right. Everybody knows that. It's all. Huh. You can see her there, right? On the next picture, she moved three feet. Where'd she go? She leaned in on the light bulb. Can't see her. Now, in either picture, if there was somebody who wanted to do something bad, would they be in the middle of the path? Here I am. No, they're in the dark shadows. And you can't see them anyway because of the glare. Well, they finally changed. We were there for a meeting a year ago, and they have all their life. But think of the money they wasted. Think of the potential problems they had with crime and other things. But you can do good things with clothes. Picture in San Antonio. See the globes? They're lit at night. They don't have hardly any light in them. So they look like sort of what they wanted to get, the antique look, many years ago. Everybody thinks the street lights come from those globes. But it's not. It's come from those smoke cut up pictures in the back. Globes are decorated. So why doesn't everybody call those things decorated? They use that way. <laughs> Get that idea, the same holds true for all kinds of other signs. You know, to 
guard from these billboards. What about an ordinance? You get that asked all the time. We have a model lighting ordinance. Here's its advantages. I put education first because even if you didn't get it, you've educated an awful lot of people. Right? And that's why persistence works. The next time around, you more get education. Next time, you more get education. Soon somebody's wife is telling that her husband, you're on a council, why don't you pass that ordinance? So everybody says, safety and security, all you nuts are trying to turn out all the lights. Well, we say, we're just trying to get rid of all the criminal friendly lights, like what you have. Why'd you put your light in? Safety. Well, then why'd you put in the criminal friendly light? Instead of an owner friendly light. Well, that's what you have to do. <laughs> Except then, it's crime prevention through environmental design, at which about 10% of their efforts is in lighting, because it is well known in these professional societies that, in fact, lighting has very little. But some human health. There are a lot of major meetings national and internationally on this. There is no question that there are human health issues. And one of these days they're going to demand. Most of them are due to ruining the circadian rhythm. You call it sea turtles, birds, fear about those, many, many things. Plus energy. All of those are important issues. And it all goes together. It's not the only issue in the world I know where with solutions everybody wins. So sound bites work. The worst thing an academic can do is to talk to a reporter. They keep going on and on and on and on and on and on and on before long he wonders if she fell asleep. So you have to learn to talk in sound bites. They all make sense, too. And where I say a little knowledge is a dangerous thing, the right sort of little knowledge is not. Based on a lot of background and not just a bunch of hand waving. Standard source. Oh, right. 